Okay, um, morning everybody. Um, and thank you for all joining us today and taking the time to connect with us in these very strange times. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Tracy Story from the London office of Erwin Mitchell. I head up the serious injury team nationally. Um, I've recently had the privilege of representing John Adams, one of our speakers today in his compensation claim, which I'm delighted to say settled successfully just after lockdown. John has kindly agreed to share his personal reflections on living with spinal cord injury and his experiences of life during lockdown. We're also joined by Andy Adamson of Backup. I will introduce both in a bit more detail shortly, but first of all, I'll deal with some housekeeping points. So thank you all for the questions that have been submitted so far. Any additional questions can be submitted throughout the sessions via the Q&A function on your screen and we'll answer them at the end. If when submitting a question, you could include your email address and contact details as well, then if we don't get to your questions, we will respond after the event. We are recording the session today so that um, that will be sent out afterwards. And towards the end of the session, we'll be posting a feedback form. If you could um, spend a few moments giving us feedback, that would be great. So turning to our first speaker today, um, John Adams was knocked off his motorcycle by a car driver whilst attending an event at Goodwood, where he was working in, in June 2016. John has a background in engineering and was a mechanic working across the world with world class racing drivers in Toyota's race team. Before the accident, John had moved into events management and hospitality, had established his own company and was attending races and events internationally. John didn't have any memory of his collision at all, but was taken to Southampton General Hospital and then transferred to Salisbury. He had a complete T3, T4 spinal cord injury. John's partner, Sue, got in touch with us on recommendation from a, a former client of ours. And we then got in contact with insurers for the driver to make some progress with the case. John, meanwhile, was transferred to Stoke Mandeville in August 2016. And I think it was there that John first met up with David Fraser, a trustee with backup um, who had a T6 injury. I think this was John's first encounter with backup and David made a huge difference to the way in which John approached his, his injury and rehabilitation. So we secured some interim funding and um, whilst John was still in hospital, Sue got busy organising adaptations and alterations to the home to prepare for John's discharge. We appointed a case manager to set up a multidisciplinary team and John returned to work, travelling abroad, sometimes with additional help, getting in the right equipment and sorting out um, the ongoing adaptations to the home. John successfully navigated international travel and accommodation and kept his business going and despite some real challenges proved to himself that he could keep going during, um, during this time. In the litigation we were requiring John to attend multiple medical assessments to produce reports for the case. The defendants then wanted to do the same and John stoically got on with this continual invasion of privacy and the constant need to retell his story so that the evidence would reflect his altered reality. Litigation can be very gruelling in this respect and I'm so grateful for John for sharing his story yet again with us today. Um, the case proceeded. Um, we had to wait and see how many things panned out. There were criminal proceedings and we had to see how whether John could sustain his efforts and avoid setbacks. We eventually secured a joint settlement meeting date for 30th March. And if you can cast your minds back to 30th March, we were a week into lockdown and we were still getting to grips with remote working and sorting out the most stable and secure way of communicating um, during lockdown. So our settlement meeting proceeded by telephone, which was far from ideal, but it was better than delaying the case further. The settlement discussions did touch on COVID-19 and the impact it would have on John's earnings going forward and how it would impact on life expectation. We also had arguments about accommodation and whether John's accommodation was going to work for later life and whether the exoskeleton device was going to be viable for John and whether 
he should purchase it and use it. But we weathered all this and came out with the settlement. Despite the limits on technology, available technology at the time, I was really pleased that we were able to bring the case to a conclusion when we did, because this allowed Sue and John to focus on their lives without the litigation hanging over them any longer. Turning to our second speaker today, Andy Adamson of Backup. Um, I first came across Backup as a much younger solicitor when I agreed to be involved in a fundraising hiking event in Hampshire. From memory, this involved a hot and exhausting trail one run where I was put to shame by much fitter wheelchair users who complained much less about the terrain than I did. I've learned from working with people who have spinal cord injury that it's very hard to generalise about the experience of adjusting to life changing injury. People bring their own unique take to this and John is a particularly vivid example of this. I previously represented people who were sporty and extrovert prior to injury, but have subsequently fallen into reclusive and depressive states. But what I have seen is that backup provides support and guidance to people at different stages in their journey and recognises the different and diverse strategies that people use to get back some quality of life. They have a variety of services which Andy is going to take you through um, today. And I have to say that their guidance through the pandemic has been excellent. Andy Adamson now runs Backup's outreach and support service and has worked for Backup for four years as a volunteer, school advocate and wheelchair skills trainer. So that's the introductions. I'm going to hand over to John now to take us through his piece. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome from uh, a, a sunny Brighton home, which is beautiful today, I have to say, really, really nice. Um, as, as Tracy said, uh, my accident was back in 2016, June. Um, I'm very fortunate, I don't actually remember any of that. Uh, for the first six weeks, I was kept in an induced coma, which, uh, looking back, uh, I can only think was a good thing to say uh, the leaf uh, that you are going to get through this. I didn't know at any time when when I would start and when I would finish, but we did and we got through it. And basically, looking back before that, as Tracy said, you know, I was traveling a lot for my work. Uh, I have a massive passion for motorbikes uh, since I was in my teens, really, my early teens. And that, that was a big part of my life was playing with motorbikes and just getting out and enjoying them, really. I, I used to commute to London and back when I worked up there. So I wasn't just a Sunday rider. I rode every day of the week for, a, well, yeah. 36 years. So anyway, it was part of my fun. Before uh, my accident, um, my part, my beautiful partner Sue and I, we were planning to get married in September, which was a, a massive thing. Uh, it had taken me uh, a number of years to ask her, but uh, for, for no real reason. But I, I did, and, and we were going to get married. And uh, it was. I remember, um, funny enough, that somebody told me afterwards that uh, I had told the uh, air ambulance crew that uh, uh, I was going to get married. I needed to get a hospital and it, and it was an important thing to me. So um, once once we got into hospital and everything was sorted and we, we started to get. I was told I had to lay still, which was a pretty hard thing to do for four months, but you do it. You know, you're told you fight it, but of course you do it along that way. And, and the NHS, uh, well, they did a marvellous job, without a doubt, because they, they put me back together and uh, all the other little injuries that I had, whether it was my leg, my pelvis or, or, my, or my shoulder or whatever, they got it all together. And I guess as, as we came out of hospital, what we were looking to do was to find a new norm. And it's quite odd because when you when you have your life and you have all the things that you do, you think, well, yeah, I, I can do all these. It's not a problem. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, my faithful wheelchair is thrown into the equation and, and you're trying to find those things and it's really really because as, as much as you try to get things focused and to get things right there's always obstacles in your way whatever it is uh, what you think is a normal thing to an able-bodied person all of a sudden somebody throws a step in the way and that just absolutely We, I started to travel for work. I was very lucky Sue came with me the first couple of times. You know, I, I left hospital in uh, beginning of February. I started to fly again in, in, in March, in the middle of March. I went to Germany and did a week's event, 
and and it was brilliant at the Nurburgring. It was just something else to get in there. But just as we thought we were finding our new norm, all of a sudden, COVID came along. And as you all know, uh, at the beginning, as Tracy said, we were really unsure what it was. Uh, oddly enough, um, in I think, uh, late February, we, we went to Lanzarote for a week uh, with, with Sue's mum and dad just to have a little bit of winter sunshine. And uh, while we were there, uh, there was talk about it and we, we laughed among ourselves saying, well, this, this isn't going to affect us. It'll be all right. It's in China and that's it. You know, a little the odd case here and there we'd heard. And of course, you know, we came back and then a week later, uh, it was really evident that things were going to tick up a little bit. Um, we, we went into lockdown probably a week and a half, two weeks before everybody else, because both Sue and I were worried about what we would do and how we would uh, get on with it. So we tried to get as self-contained as possible. Um, the new word of the year, Zoom, came into our, our world and all of a sudden people were there on Zoom and, and oh, OK, well, let's let's meet by Zoom if we can, which, which was a, a brilliant thing to do without a doubt. I think we were quite paranoid at the beginning. Uh, every day I would check my blood pressure, I'd do my temperature, um, check for anything on there. And you say, well, you know, did we see those people? Uh, are they all right? You know, it's just really strange. You, you, you think you have it all under control, all of a sudden you don't. Um, it, it's odd because people have said, how was the restriction? How, how did that you know, hit, hit you? And, and, and how, how did you deal with it along the way? But in a way I'd had, well, nearly four years of practice of being disabled. And, and all of a sudden that being that disabled gives you a completely different outlook on the on the way that you look at things and, and you do you plan things far more in advance. Uh, I, know, I know some of our friends will turn up at restaurants and then wonder how they get in, but it, it's a matter of just all of a sudden you've got to ring and say, well, actually, yeah, I'm in a wheelchair. Oh, yeah, that's no problem. So uh, but we don't have a disabled toilet. OK, fair enough. We get over there's, there's always kinds of things. Basically, what, what I did at the beginning of uh, this, this lockdown was look at it and go. I looked at it as a project, basically, and I, I do project work and that's what I do. So I, I tried to understand what did we need to do? We, we needed to get some equipment to do some physical exercise and we needed obviously the full understanding of all our friends and family. Uh, at the beginning, we couldn't get any food delivered, so uh, both my brother and one of Stu's boys helped to bring in uh, bring in food, which was great. We were just trying to limit our uh, outside activity so that we didn't really get too involved with things on that way. It's odd when, when you start to look back at the, the previous few weeks or, or months now, really, that have gone on. Things which are really hard is, is the lack of human contact. I, I love getting out and seeing people and, and just being with my friends, my work friends or my colleagues or, or friends and family. And it was really quite tough to take that in. And yes, Zoom replaces it, which it was a bit of a novelty at the moment, but that novelty only lasts a certain amount of time and you just need that human contact. We are humans. Uh, going out, uh, going to cinemas, uh, cafes, uh, restaurants, you know, I live in a beautiful part of the world, Brighton, and, and we can get in and we can see things. It's, it's it's really nice on that way. The other things, of course, we, we had holidays booked and all of a sudden it was like, well, uh, so we we're going to go to Italy and, and we were going to go to Greece. Uh, two places, there's no possibility could we go to. So all of a sudden you've got to do all the cancellations and, and change all those things. There are so many things you need to start to think about. Uh, and one of the most important things I think is actually getting a routine, because if you're not careful after the first week, every day feels like the same. There's, there's no Saturday, Sundays. It's, it's every day is it's just another day coming along. And, and that's really, really hard because building that new routine means looking deep inside to find some reason to get up, to do things. And, and that, that is quite tough. And one of the things which I really wanted to start with to, to give you an idea. When, when I left hospital, what, what was really important to me was to, to have independence. Uh, and what uh, Owen Mitchell gave me the possibility was to have that independence, to have the pre-funding so that we could adapt certain things in our home. It, it was, 
I, I would say 25% down, but it was livable. You know, I could get in the front door and I could get upstairs because we had a lift all of a sudden. There were a lot of other things to do, but that was to follow on. And that 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 was done over the last uh, two, three years in, in that way. But independence is a massive thing to me. It really is. It, it's, I, I just live that I can just go off and do anything. I, I, I was taught by my father that if it's made by man, you can repair it. So I didn't mind. I was taught when I was a kid, if it's a washing machine, a lawnmower, a car, you just repair it. Or if you want things done around here, you just do it. But trying to do that, of course, is, is a very different thing. So anyway, to, to be able to do that, the one thing which I, I, I saw in hospital, uh, as you'll see in the photo in a second, was that four months of laying on your back sounds like a dream world, but unbelievable how all of a sudden you absolutely have no muscle strength whatsoever. So the, the photo which we will bring up now shows you that was the first time that I'd got into a wheelchair. It was the 10th of October. Uh, um, 2016 and uh, Tim, my physio on, on the right and Ian, his, his colleague, wheeled me just outside onto a balcony. I cannot tell you how amazing that was to breathe fresh air for the first time. Sorry, it still brings back a slight uh, moment to me, but it was just unbelievable to do that. And, and what I didn't realise was that I just had no strength. Uh, you know, I, I obviously I tried to put a smile on there, but I, I couldn't even hold my neck straight. Uh, I, I couldn't even lift a toothbrush to brush my teeth. And I thought, I've got to sort this out. Somehow I've got to find a way to get back. And and the, mo the first thing was to be able to get into a wheelchair on my own because for the first couple of uh, probably four to six weeks, actually, I was hoisted out of the... Um, out of the uh, um, uh, bed into my wheelchair. And I, I got down to gym and I exercised. As soon as I, uh, we came into lockdown, I thought, I've got to keep this strength, the strength that I've worked so hard on the last two to three years. So what, what we did was, luckily, I've got a, a brilliant physio teacher. I, I was doing hydro at the time, but of course that stopped immediately. And, and unfortunately, uh, it hasn't started again yet. But uh, uh, Nikki, my physio teacher, put together a Zoom program and uh, she said, well, look, let's try and do it at home. Uh, I had a few little weights here, but uh, we, we managed to get a gym mat. And uh, what I'll do now is we'll show you a little video of the exercise that, that we, we're doing in that way. I'll, I'll try and talk you through it to give you an idea of what it's like. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough, uh, we, we fitted it all down in the lounge. And, and, and the first thing really is obviously, I can't do this on my own we, without my amazing wife. Uh, who, who's become my sort of part-time physio teacher. Uh, she's been a brilliant at helping me in, in just adjusting to, to come around to it. Nikki, uh, the lady on the screen, has been absolutely awesome again. She's really helped us both understand the ways of doing it. So I understand this will be very difficult for one person on their own, but the most important thing to have is to have that, keep that movement. Say so what I didn't want to lose is the movement that I've gained over over the those three and a half, three years, three and a bit years to get those exercises together on there. So the, the, the program that Nikki's put together for us, we vary it depending on the, the day. At the moment, I'm doing three sessions a week. I do two strength sessions. So this is one of the strength sessions and I do one core session uh, because we, we can't do hydro. I am very lucky. I've got a couple of friends who've got pools and I have been in two or three times now into, the, into their pool, which is just amazing. As I say, uh, having good friends and family around you is, is phenomenal. It's, it's something you really, you just never value until you're in this position when you just cannot do things on your own and you need some help from other people to go around on that way. But the exercise program that we do, we vary each time. There's, there's, there's nothing which is the same. My big goal has always been, since I've left hospital, to be able to get into my wheelchair on my own. That, that's my goal. And rightly or wrongly, as a, as a T3 complete, that's quite a difficult thing, which anybody might understand who, who understands what it is. I'm, I'm quite a big guy. You know, I'm six foot two. 
Um, before my accident, I was I had 96, 97 kilos. I'm now 90 kilos. I'm trying to keep that consistent. But all of this exercise is about having that consistency and just being able to get in and out. And we, we do another part uh, just in, in our garage, which is just playing with the ball, just working on trying to keep those muscles going and getting around on it. It's, it's important to understand that some of the things that we're doing are actually relatively simple. You know, it's just a, a little one kilo medicine ball or a football ball you can use. Again, it looks really easy sometimes, but I can't tell you how hard it is. One of the things which has happened actually during uh, my lockdown is that I've been very fortunate that just down the road from us, there's a little road that I can push up and down. And I worked out that if I did um, 18 times up and down the, the car park, the tennis club car park, and by the time I got home, I'd have done 5K. So with the weather okay, I'd go out and I'd do a 5K push. And, and that's helped a lot. Uh, while I was there, I, I, one day I met a guy there and I had a chat with him and it turned out he was the chairman of the tennis club. He said, well, why don't you do wheelchair tennis? We're, we're accessible. And I said, well, I've never really thought about it. And anyway, cut a long story short, we've now started on that. And uh, I'm, I'm again, I've been introduced to a really nice uh, uh, trainer. He's I've done a few lessons with him and it's, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant to, to get out and, and enjoy uh, to be able to do those type of things. I think during the, um, the lockdown, as I said earlier on, one of the things we really want to do is have a routine, uh, whether that was routine of uh, I, I would sort of take over the cooking or whether it was routine of doing Zoom on certain days, but those were what we would do. And uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, being a, a, a budding engineer, I spent quite a lot of time doing research on my wheelchair. I, I'm phenomenal about the weight on it. Uh, I, I want to make sure that the weight is as light as possible because in the end of the day, I've got to weave it along, so I've learned as much as I can about what type of bearings, what type of wheels and tires and everything else. Just something to keep my brain occupied. Um, work has dried up completely at the moment, which is, is a, it's no surprise compared with everybody else. But I've always done my work because I love it, not because I have to do it. And I've been very, very fortunate to have some amazing jobs and meet some amazing people over time. But the other things obviously one needed to do during this uh, lockdown was you need to make sure that uh, medicine, you have your medicine and everything else. That was a bit of a concern at the beginning. You know, would I have enough? You know, I've got enough catheters for maybe four to six weeks. But if I don't have those, all of a sudden the world is a very different place. And, and it's really hard for people to understand, as, as I've just learned from enough with uh, Adam, my tennis teacher, he has no understanding that below this level, I feel nothing. I have no understanding when I'm going to go to the loo. I have nothing at all, no feelings whatsoever. Everything is done manually. So it's really important that, that you build a good relationship with your, your doctor. I have a fantastic doctor. Um, she's been absolutely brilliant to me ever since I came out of hospital. And uh, whatever I need, I know I can email her. She knows that uh, I'm quite serious about it. And, and they would make time to sort things out. So it's really important to get that network around you that works well, and it does. It works really, really well for me. We started to come out of lockdown probably middle of June, I would say, uh, which is a little bit after everybody else. Again, we're slightly nervous on this. We, we don't really know how far to go. Uh, we've been down to the seafront a few times, pushed along there. It's bright and airy. It's wide. It's no problem to have people around, but you know. They're socially distancing with our friends and family. We've been to their gardens, we sit in the garden. The weather has been amazing for all of us and, and it, it has been a, an absolutely fantastic uh, bonus for us. Of course, we're all thinking about what will happen if there is a second wave. Uh, looking around the world, we will study the news, we look and see what happens. We, we have to be prepared. You know, at the moment, I'm just getting a couple of the weights in so that I, I've got things here. I think we've learned an awful lot from it and hopefully everybody will be OK. Um, I think that what what we find a long a lot of a lot of the time along this way is that. Some people are out really quickly and others aren't. We're, we're somewhere in between. We're just playing along on that way. But you know, it's. 
part of our life. It's what we've got to put up with now and that's it. We've just got to get on. So what was my new norm? We are now getting another new norm. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And um, I know there'll be a time for any questions on this. What I'd like to do now is hand over to um, Andy Adamson from Backup. As I say, I was introduced to Backup very early on through a good friend of ours who it was a friend, but they all become, became a very good friend of ours, David. It gave me a chance to understand. I remember the first time I met David. And afterwards, I thought, he's driven to Stoke Mandeville. He's got in a wheelchair and he's come and see me. I can do that. And that's exactly what Backup have done for me. Andy, I'll give it over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, John. I think that was a fantastic insight. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, for the introduction as well. And um, as I say, my name's Andy. I'm from Backup and the Outreach and Support Manager there. Um, and um, I was actually injured about 12 years ago in a mountain biking accident. And as John says there, my first introduction again with Backup was when I was at the spine unit at Stoke Mandeville and um, again doing wheelchair skills. And again, very much as John was saying there, it was very much just about meeting somebody who was on the outside, who was out there living their life, doing day to day things, traveling about and just getting on with their family lives and going back to work and things like that. I think um, lockdown has obviously made a lot of changes to the way that, uh, that backup work, obviously. Um, and I wanted to outline um, briefly um, some of the challenges that backup have seen and what has changed during COVID. I think um, I was going to start off just by talking about what we've seen um, at the spinal centres in the acute setting. And um, so at those rehab centres, um, the way that, that things are working has completely changed. And um, so there aren't any visitors going on and um, going into the wards to see their loved one who's had the injury. Um, people are having shorter stays um, as there's a lot more pressure to to move people through the system more quickly um, and staff are unable to give the support um, that they would have done usually. So um, where you would have had a gym and, and people going to the gym and doing their rehab sessions there, often the gyms are closed um, and people uh, are having to do their rehab on their bedside. Uh, we've also seen um, more social distancing at the at the centres as well with, um, with people um, who would usually be on a six, six bed ward now being on a four bed ward uh, so a smaller group of people in that rehab process as well um, and we've also had less capacity for us to offer face-to-face -face, uh, support as well uh, so there haven't been any of our volunteer skills trainers or anything like that going into the centres um, and offering peer support face-to-face -face. Um, so it's, so it really is quite a tough time for anyone who's doing their rehab at the moment and to get the support they need and and to 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 have successful results through rehab. Uh, but we do know that all the staff at the centres are, are doing a fantastic job doing everything they possibly can to make sure that experience um, is as smooth as possible. Um, in the home environment as well, um, we've also seen a, a whole load of new challenges there as well, uh, with lots of increased isolation where people have been um, shielding at home or, or in lockdown. And um, so they haven't been able to see family members and they haven't been able to get out and and do the things that they usually would be doing. Um, and I think this has led to, to a whole um, kind of um, um, whole uh, plethora of, of new issues, I suppose. And um, so, for example, people have found it difficult to get appointments with GPs or wheelchair services to to sort out their wheelchair um, and you know, just keeping up daily routines as well. So things like doing your exercise and and getting out and about meeting friends and and keeping yourself fit and active. And I think you know that that has exacerbated things and um, that people with spinal cord injury deal with every day such as pain and fatigue and feeling isolated anyway and an increased level of stress as well and and, a, and the difficulty sleeping as well and um, so that's a, that's what a lot of people are telling us that we speak to out and about in the community and um, it's that you know it's affecting their stress levels, affecting their sleep um, and affecting their their ability to function really. And um, so the question was um, what, what what did backup decide to to do about this? 
Um, so Backup have, have introduced a whole uh, basically new range of services to, to help support people at this time. Um, so first of all there, um, we've got what we've described our Backup Live service. Uh, so because we can't go and visit patients at the spinal centres and see them face to face, um, as myself and John both experienced when we were first injured, um, we have started up what we've called um, peer support live sessions or backup live sessions, uh, where we've basically brought the support to the bedside of the people at the spinal centres. Um, so we've actually been doing that at, at each of the spinal centres. We've agreed a time and a date uh, where myself or another member of the outreach team has been on, on a call for, for anyone to tune into from the ward. Um, and it's been very much a place where people can just talk about their experience of, of going through rehab, talk about you know what life looks like outside, like all the things we've been talking about, you know, how do I get around? How do I go on holiday? What does your flat look like? You know, how do, how do your adaptions work at home? And those have been incredibly powerful sessions. Um, and sometimes we even have people come along who um, are on the same wards as each other, but have never had the opportunity to chat to each other or, or meet uh, because they've been confined to their bed spaces. Um, so that's something that we're, we're continuing to do and you know, I think have a, have a real powerful reach um, and where possible we've been delivering those uh, with our colleagues at Aspire and SIA as well. And um, the second um, service that we've been really pushing on is, um, is really fast tracking mentoring and outreach and support. Um, so Backup have a, have a selection of about 200 trained mentors um, who, um, who give telephone support um, to, to people at any point through their rehab journey. Uh, but we've really been targeting that support to people who are at spinal centres at the moment and really need that support. And um, so it's been the job of my team to basically fast track those people we've been meeting at centres to make sure they're getting the support that they need um, and also their families as well. Uh, we've also been busy videoing ourselves doing lots of wheelchair skills as well. Um, so we've got a, ten, a set of 10 basic or start, starting off basic. So doing things like just pushing your chair, moving up to more advanced cha chair skills, such as going up and down curbs or uh, dealing with a staircase potentially. Um, and we've also been doing some videos on kind of life skills as well. And um, so making a cup of tea or making your bed or how to transfer into your car and just making sure that those are widely available uh, to people at this time who might be, you know, wanting to develop their skills at home or, or in need of that support. And um, thirdly, we've got our backup lounge service, um, which is a weekly, uh, a, a weekly virtual space uh, hosted every, every Friday afternoon where people can drop in and join us for, for a bit of a chat. Uh, we have also had um, sort of a, a number of um, lounges within the lounge uh, where people can go to discuss all sorts of different uh, concerns that they may have. Um, there's a chance there for parents of young people uh, to meet other parents of young people. Uh, there's, so there's an arts and crafts group that meet up there, up in there weekly or comparing their, their crafts that they've been coming up with each week. Uh, we've also been addressing things like uh, pain and fatigue and pain is something that a lot of people have been telling us that has has really kind of been a problem for a lot of people or really been exacerbated by the lockdown in, in terms of people not being able to get on and do their, their normal routine of stuff. Um, and that's somewhere where people could go and share tips and advice of how to deal with the pain um, going through going through lockdown um, and speak to other people in a similar situation. Um, we've also and they created some dedicated online services for children and young people. Um, so we've had our youth advisory group um, of young people and, and, uh, and children meeting up virtually. Um, and we've actually had some of the best turnouts we've ever seen, uh, better than we've actually done those meetups um, in person. Um, we've also got a week of tailored workshops coming up next week. Uh, so we're looking at all sorts of different, uh, different kind of issues. So things like wheelchair maintenance, Things like thinking about returning to university um, and, um, and cooking as well. So obviously an important one there as well for, for children and young people. Um, so um, moving on to um, 
my uh, or our uh, top tips for lockdown. So I've put these together basically through what people have been sharing in our lounge um, and also from all sorts of different contacts and um, you know, and everyone at backup as well. Um, and you know, they, by no means are they sort of a, a fix for everyone, but I tried to encapture as sort of as, as wide ranging opinions as I could um, to share with you guys today. Um, so my first top tip was to stay connected. Um, so obviously Zoom is fantastic. I think we're, we've probably all been spending a bit longer on Zoom and MS Teams um, than we would have been doing beforehand. Uh, but I think it's also really important to remember the other side of communications or more traditional side of communications. So writing letters or postcards and um, meeting up in person if you can for a distance drink um, and keeping in touch with family and friends as well. Number two uh, was making time to move. Um, so moving about I think is incredibly important for somebody with a spinal cord injury. I think when you stop moving around, I think you know all of the issues that, that affect people with spinal cord injury day to day really exacerbate themselves. So that lack of routine, that managing pain and fatigue, that that mood as well, managing your mood as well. I think it's incredibly important just to move around to um, to kind of help help prevent that. Um, and you know, joining in online yoga sessions, joining in online exercise sessions, doing exercises such as John was showing us there, um, is a is a really really um, important thing to do and something that's really really going to help. Uh, number three was perhaps taking on a new hobby. Uh, so this could be anything really, this could be taking on a new language, painting, crafts, baking, um, setting goals if it's helpful, but if not, not, have, not, not stressing yourself about not meeting goals as well, or, or you know, not setting goals if it's going to be something that stresses you out as well. Um, it's something that potentially would help you keep in control, when I think there's so many things out there that are out of our control or, or um, uncontrollable. Uh, having something that you can control, maybe keeping a, a diary of how you're getting on with that hobby, um, or as I say, setting a few goals if you're comfortable doing that as well. Number four um, was to release your inner OAP. Um, so what I mean by that is to, I suppose, let life slow down a bit um, if, if you feel that that would work for you. So embrace the countryside, embrace wildlife, Embrace your pets if you have them at home. Really kind of enjoy the situation um, at the moment as you can. Let life slow down. Um, and if you don't have a pet, obviously borrow one um, as well. Um, and also, you know, maybe think about getting a, a fluffy pair of slippers as well. Make yourself comfortable in your home. You're gonna be spending more time there um, and, and enjoy yourself there as well. Um, and as I say, you know, getting into crafting as well. So, you know, whether it's baking, um, or catching up with family and friends, just you know, really, really embracing that home life. Uh, number five was to just embrace the strange situation that we're in. Um, so obviously, it's something that we've never gone through before. Um, and I think you know we should try and enjoy each day as it comes and and embrace the situation. And that sort of brings me onto my final one, which was really to be kind to yourself and and to others. And you know, that's that's really really crucial to, to getting through this period, I think. Thank you very much. I think we've got some uh, some time for questions, hopefully, um, coming up. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you both very much for, for your talks. It was really interesting to hear. Um, I'm, I, I take on board my inner OAP very and take that very seriously, Andy. Thank you very much. And John, thank you. Thank you again for, for, for your talk. We've got a few questions coming through. Um, first, the first question I, I, I'd like to direct towards Andy. Um, if at this time, what's the most common query or biggest concern that people with spinal cord injury are raising uh, with backup? Yeah, uh, thanks Tracy. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think, um, you know, I think the overall kind of feeling that we're getting is it's really a feeling of frustration, a feeling that people really don't know what the situation is going to look like in the future or how long this is going to go on for. 
And I think, you know, that's been exacerbated by things like people waiting for uh, wheelchairs to get sorted, you know, people perhaps struggling to get adaptions done at their home. And so they're really struggling, I think, to move things forwards at times. And I think that that kind of manifests itself in people really kind of hit, hitting the wall in a way and not being able to see a, a clear way forwards. And I think, you know, what Backup have tried to do, uh, certainly through the live, live lounges, through the live sessions and the lounges, is to offer a space where people can can talk about those feelings and, and really, I guess, drain the pool of negativity um, and talk to other people in similar situations to talk about how they're dealing with it. Um, I think you know those feelings aren't going to go away, uh, but I think having that space to talk about them um, and talk to other people who are going through exactly the same thing um, has really been a been a been a help to those people. Thank, thank you, Andy. That's that's great. Um, question for John, really. Um, I think isolation, socialisation, uh, social isolation has been a big issue for all of us at the moment, but. Could you describe what's kept you positive during lockdown? You've touched on this when you were talking, uh, John. You, um, I, I don't know whether your your project management skills have come into this, but how, how have you kept yourself going? Yeah, uh, Tracy, it's, it's an interesting question because I, I guess most things that I get involved with, I know there's a start, a middle and an end. And, and the odd thing with, with COVID is we know there was a start and we were in the middle, but we don't really know where the end is. I think um, for a start, seven months in hospital uh, was, a, was a massive training ground for me uh, to understand that you, you, know, you have to find new ways to do things. Everything is thrown at you in a, in a completely different shape to what you thought. And, and every day, basically now, I, and, and this might sound slightly odd, but when you've been that close to not being alive, every day is a bonus. And I think people take that upon themselves sometimes. They need to reflect back on that. Before my accident, I'm sure stupid things would be really irritating me. And they'd be little things. There is no point in the little things irritating you. The little things will go away. You'll get by with those. Worry about the big things that you have to do. And also, of course, the final point with that is get great people around you. And, and I'm very lucky. I've got really great people. You know, my wife is just absolutely amazing. Uh, my friends and family have been unbelievably supportive of me. And, and the guys that I used to work with have just supported me all the way through that. And we still stay in contact. And that's, I think, as Andy said, you know, meet up, just have a chat with them. And there are people I've met through backup you know, which I just have a chat with every so often. I just ring them up. We just have a quick chat and, and it's it's important to do that. Thanks. Thanks, John. And um, that's very helpful. Um, Andy, I know that John has a particular mindset and a way of dealing. Um, but um, in terms of general advice um, to the people that Backup are supporting, is there any sort of guidance you can give in terms of building a new routine um, uh, for people and how they go about doing that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's very much an individual approach that, that we would take take there, Tracy. I think, you know, any, you, you can look at people, people's level of injury, for example, and, you know, you might be able to sort of make certain assumptions about somebody with a similar level of injury. But, you know, almost every time somebody with the same level of injury or two people with the same level of injury, their needs would be completely different. Um, so for So for me, it's about kind of helping that person find a tailored approach for, for their situation. And I think, you know, that's, that's something that Backup really pride ourselves in, is being able to work with that individual to, to find solutions to their own, uh, to their own, to their own problems. And um, so it's very much about uh, working through, you know, what those problems are, you know, just having a chance to talk about those problems is a, is a massive help sometimes to people as well. So just getting those problems out there and then helping that person, you know, help them find a way forward to deal with those um, is really, really important. And obviously we've got we've got all of the mentors or, or the mentoring service there uh, to match people up uh, who have been through a similar situation. One thing that we're really strong on is making sure that where we do match people up with somebody 
through the mentoring service. We make sure that you know they've got similar life experiences, they've got similar um, similar kind of family setup, um, similar kind of work setup where we can as well, and that we really try and make that match as close as we can, so that people um, can really have have a chance to talk to somebody who's been through that situation before, and 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 help them work a way forwards. I think. Does that answer Thank the question? Or? I think it does. Thank you. Um, there is a there is a question that's directed at John, but I think you probably both um, should um, try and try and answer this one. Um, starting with John, um, is there anything you know now that you wish you had known when you first suffered your injury? So thinking back to the early days, John, do you want to have a go at that one first? Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll happily have a go at that. Um, I think keeping the positive mindset, as Andy says, is, is a very hard thing to do. And some days, there are days when I wake up and I think, you know what, she's man, it would be so nice just to be able to get outside. Uh, our front window looks onto a road and I see people walk past every day or they're out running or whatever. And I think, oh my God, it would be so nice to be able to do that. But in the end, I can get out in my wheelchair and I can do that. And I think it's really, really important to try to focus on the things that you can do and not the things that you can't do. You know, there are, there are a list of things that I can't do that I that I would love to do, but just forget about those. Get out. You know, we, we get out. We, I get out in my wheelchair. Uh, I, I drive everywhere I want to go. If I want to go on my own, I can. It's not a problem. Obviously, COVID has made it slightly more difficult, but then we get a mask and we use a mask hand sanitizer, keep your hands clean and tidy, everything else, all those things. So I, th I think it is just looking at those things and saying, well, yeah, there are things I would love to do, but yeah, I can't. So well, what do you think, Andy? Yeah, that's, that's great advice, I think, John. Um, but I think for me, um, I almost, when I was injured, I was about 20, 26 years old. Um, and I actually moved back in with my parents because quite fortunately, they loved, they lived in a bungalow and the flat I was living in was a was an Edinburgh tenement flat on the third floor, um, but I think when I was when I first sort of came out of that hospital and and sort of started my my new life, I suppose, so I found myself being quite fearsomely independent. I describe it as, so I almost wouldn't let anyone help me with anything, and um, because um, because I was so fearsomely fearsomely determined to do it myself. Looking back on that. I kind of think that maybe it wasn't the best thing to be doing because I was often sort of pushing family members away or pushing pushing friends who who wanted to help, who were being helpful. And you have your limits. So you know, I saw myself as as being quite a fit and able T3 uh, paraplegic. You know, wanting to do as much stuff as I could for myself. But even I have my limits. So you know, I think what I would say is knowing when to ask for help and knowing your limits and um, because I think it's a continual lear learning process you know even 12 years down the line I'm I'm still learning a lot of stuff and um, and what I would say to my my newly injured self would be really you know not to be too hard on yourself in that in that first year to to use communication to talk to people where you need some help with things because you know 10 times out of 10 as I've found people seem more than happy to help and it's a great way to engage with people and, and everybody has their limits, I think. Mm. No, that's that's really interesting. I think um, for the lawyers on 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 the call, um, a lot of us we we have to sort of wait and see how things pan out, and there, you know, progress is often not as linear as we would like. And so sometimes with where people put in enormous amounts of efforts to keep things going, it's not necessarily sustainable, and we kind of have to see the whole picture before we can. Um, litigate the cases properly and uh, so there is a wait and see approach but there is a journey and, and, and people move along it in different ways but you can go through periods of fierce independence where actually a little bit of assistance or the right kind of equipment can make an or enormous amounts of difference so I think that's really helpful. Um, I've got another question for you Andy coming up about support in hospital. Um, the um, the question is, can backup support those in hospital who are awaiting spinal rehab? Um, because I think capacity is an issue and they're waiting in hospital for weeks waiting for a bed. Is, is there anything that backup can do in those situations? 
Absolutely. Um, so we, we support people right from, you know, the very first days of, of being injured right through to, you know, people who've been injured 20, 30 years. So it absolutely doesn't matter um, when people would like support. So absolutely. We know, obviously, that a lot of people um, don't go to spinal centres immediately after their injuries. And um, so we would love to be reaching out to those people. Um, and the best way, if you do have anyone like that, um, for us to get in touch is, is just to refer them to us. So get in touch and and let us know the details, and we can organise um, whether it's a whether it's a Zoom call or a telephone call, or, um, or getting in touch with the, their family members. And um, we offer that that service as well, and um, we have a whole service around supporting the family as well. And um, so we're absolutely equipped and ready to to be dealing with people um, right from the early stages. And, you know, from our point of view, um, the earlier that we can get in touch and, you know, chat to somebody about their situation, you know, the better, because, you know, we can talk talk straight away about, you know, what the future might be looking like um, and just be be that ear that, that has been through it and, and can understand what they're going through at, at this time. So absolutely refer them through. Yeah, I mean, I thoroughly recommend the backup website and um, the wheelchair skills videos are, you know, pretty good stuff and um, all put together very, you know, very professionally and really very helpful for, for people. Um, this is a question for John um, and it's if you could meet, it's very similar to a previous question, but a slightly different angle. If you could meet the pre-accident John now, what's the best piece of advice you would give him to help him through the rehabilitation and litigation process? Um, I think the, 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 the most important thing is, is to keep positive. I've always had a very positive view on life and never felt that anything was impossible. I, I totally get what Andy says about finding a time when you need a help. And, and I, I would do that. People used to say to me, you know, before my accident, what, what's, what's your, your weakness? And I'd always say spelling because I'm atrocious at it. You know, I'm dyslexic and I, I just never, I, I still struggle with spelling now, but it's something which I had to deal with. I think it's really important that you accept where you are. I think that's the first thing is be happy with yourself. That's really, really important. Whether you're happy with your, your inner self or your outer self, accept it. You know, when I woke up and, and somebody told me that I'd never move my legs again, I, I just thought, oh, right, okay, I better get on with this. Huh? And, and that was it really, just have a positive outlook. And I, I think that's sometimes of course, I find that really easy and other people find it really hard and I understand why people find it hard. But yeah, the, the only advice I say is just keep a positive head and, and people around me have been phenomenal. And that's whether that's friends, family or just I'm at an airport or down the town or something or other or I want to get a sandwich. They want to help you. Let them help you. They want to help you. They feel good about it. I feel good about it. Yeah. I think, John, we've had previous conversations with your international travel where you've described having to be fairly assertive about your needs when traveling. I mean, it's probably not so current now, um, given the current situation, but, um, you know, just being able to educate people about what your injury is and getting the help that you need from them, but you know, assuming that they probably don't understand how how to approach you know, getting you onto a plane, etc., so that you, you're being assertive and, and, and so forth. Um, another question has arisen about um, physio, and I know that, um, John, you've had huge amounts of support from physio and it's been of great benefit, but um, have either you or Andy had occupational therapy input in your journey? Um, I don't know, John, if you want to take that yeah, first. I, I'll start with that. We, we have had some. But uh, to be really honest, and, and, and I, uh, this is not for everybody, I am a very practical person. Uh, if, if I look at something, I'll go, oh yeah, we'll find a solution for that. It doesn't matter what it is. And I understand I'm probably not the best person to ask that question because I think other people do need that help far more. As I said, you know, my, I could help with my spelling if they can help me with that. But uh, if it was coming up with ideas, one of the most important things for us or for both Sue and I, when I came out of hospital was, I said to Sue, 
I don't want my home to look like a hospital. And, it, and it's been really a lot of work to make that work. I, I've had amazing builders and electricians and everybody who have helped me do that. And again, I think it goes back to your previous point where you said about traveling. It's me, me as a disabled person, or I, sorry, I don't term myself a disabled. I just don't have legs. It's as simple as that. I can't use them. It's me that understands that. I need to explain that to other people. So whether that's traveling or the, the, the kitchen that we had made for us, the, the guys that did it, they'd never done anything like this before, but they were willing to sit down and listen to what the issues were. Oh, so you need to be get under because you, you don't have a core. Like with the guy that's been helping me with my tennis, he's never taught somebody with a T3 injury before. I think he has done a little bit of wheelchair stuff, but never with a T3. So he, he doesn't understand that, you know, when I lean forward, I'm going to fall. But it's only I that know that. And I have to tell that through to him. And it's really, really important that you do that because it's, it's, it's me that would have the injury afterwards if I didn't tell them. Thank you. Andy, and did you have OT input? Yeah, I was just going to add that, that, you know, as John says, they, they obviously play a, a crucial role and it can depend a bit on kind of the level of adaption that you need at home. Uh, but for me, yeah, that's sort of that kind of initial um, support in, in getting my home adapted so I could move back there or, or my parents' home as it was at the time um, was really crucial. I think the other place that the OT plays a or played and does play a very important role is is kind of looking at what the future looks like, particularly around vocation and work. Um, so um, there's been various studies done on this, but um, it's it's widely agreed that unless somebody with a spinal cord injury is thinking about returning to work within six weeks of having their injury. After six weeks, their chances of returning to work actually start to go down quite dramatically. Mm. So I think for me, that support in you know talking about what the future looks like in terms of work and thinking about what skills you, you still have and how you could use them in the workplace or um, how you can actually use your, your experience going through rehab and what you've learned through having your injury as a positive in the workplace and, and something that you can use to sell yourself was actually really, really important uh, for me. Lovely, thank you. Um, we have a comment from Stephen, which is a, quite a nice way to end this session. Stephen has commented, I want to congratulate both Adam and um, and John for their open, oh sorry, Andy and John for their openness and honesty about their situation. Um, as a, a guy who's been injured myself for 37 years. It does get easier as time goes on and it does become the norm. But as the guys have said, stay positive and there's always a way of completing the challenge, whatever that is. So that's a nice positive way to round things up today. Um, so I just want to wrap up now um, and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and to thank our speakers today um, for their really insightful um, talks and their, their honesty and um, openness about the difficulties and and the positive sides of, 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 of their journey. Um, if you do have any further questions for us after this session, please do get in touch. The, the contact details are on screen now and you can get in touch with us direct. Um, don't forget to check out Backup's website. It is, it is very good. And don't forget to check out our coronavirus hub on the Owen Mitchell website, which covers all things legal and financial relating to the pandemic. And please do let us have your feedback. There's going to be a link to um, feedback. And if you've got a couple of minutes, if you could fill that in for us, that would be great. But thank you all again for your questions. Thank you for our, to our speakers and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.